Escape from the barn. Sharing a nest was a new experience for Chick, one that he wouldn't have minded had he not woke up with someone's foot in his face. He started to move it away when suddenly, Biddy Polachek began loudly balking. Wicky, 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 time to move your tail feathers, shaky, shaky. Suddenly, everyone around Chick erupted into a torrent of furious fuzzies trying to stampede over him and out of the nest. Dazed and confused, Chick was able to force himself to stand up amidst the rampaging downy horde to keep himself hidden. Biddy Polichick balked commands to try to get control of her chicks. Come on, come on, let's go, Faye, over here. Sophie, get down from there. Daisy, go help your sister. Jolt and Tiddle, you two stop pecking each other. Finia, where's Finia? Oh, there you are. All right, let's all line up. Get ready to go out for breakfast and then our dust bath. Moving a bunch of chicks like this was a major operation. Biddy Polichick was like a general marshalling her troops for an attack. Of course, moving as many chicks as Biddy had was like planning a major invasion. Biddy Polichick was the mother hen of the largest brood in the homestead. The chicks in her nest were the youngest of her family. The Polichick brood was made up of Many pullets and cockerels of all ages and sizes, not to mention all the adult chickens she had raised. No one was exactly sure what the population of the Bala Chick brood was. The best that anyone could estimate that over a quarter of all the chickens in the barn were Bala Chicks. Being the mother hen to such a large brood had caused many to wonder why Biddy Polichick was herself not the superior mother hen, or at the very least, an auntie, and sitting on the council of aunties. The truth of the matter was that Biddy Polichick was happy, content, and comfortable right where she was, and so solidly entrenched in her position in the pecking order no one could move her, even if they used dynamite. Biddy liked her spot because she was not so low in the pecking order that she got bullied by other hens, but not so high up that she had to fight to keep her place. Speaking of trying to keep one's place, Chick was doing just that as they headed towards the barn door. He was desperately trying to stay in the middle of the chick mob so he wouldn't get spotted. However, chicks, like adult chickens, have a pecking order too, especially in a clutch as big as Biddy's. Every chick was pecking, pushing, shoving, and pulling to try to get ahead of the other and to be first. Being first meant that you got to gobble up the choicest grubs, seeds, and whatever else one found before the crush of the siblings overtook you. Once outside, the Polichicks moved like locusts, devouring anything that was smaller than them or could at least fit in their mouths. If one wasn't the first, then the next plan of attack was to snatch something from a sibling and devour it before they or someone else could snatch it away. This is why so many Paula Chick children grew up to be excellent scramble players. Scramble was a game that homestead chickens liked to play. Serious scramble league games are more organized than the everyday amateur counterparts. In the Scramble League were teams, points, and scoring. In the amateur games was every hen for herself. A game would begin when a group of chickens would go out to forage. 
the first one to find something interesting, whether edible or not, was called a scrum, and that hen would start to run with it, while the others would suddenly give chase and try to take it away. Amateur scrumble players preferred the scrum to be something tasty like a long wiggly and juicy or big fat and crunchy. The game ended when the scrum was either eaten or just fell apart, in which case those parts were eaten by whoever got to them first. This, of course, described perfectly any meal with the polychick brood, which gave credence to the speculation that the game was actually invented by one of the Polichick's ancestors. As Biddy Polichick herded her mob of chicks towards the barn door, Chick saw that Wedgie and Fudgy were standing at the door. There was a long line of chickens waiting to go out, because last night's intruder was never caught. The mid-hens, however, suspected this intruder was still in the barn, and they were checking to make sure whoever went out was actually a legal resident of the barn. When Chick realized this, he scrunched down as far as he could in the hopes of being able to slip past. When Biddy Polichick got to the end of the line, she began squawking at Wedgie. What's going on here? You there, I say, you there. Wedgie did not respond. She just continued to check the chickens one by one through the checkpoint. Not one to be ignored, Biddy Polichick proceeded to squawk even louder. Excuse me, excuse me, I say, hello, hello. I'm talking to you. Don't act like you can't hear me. I know you can hear me. Hello. Chick started to get anxious. He was afraid that all of the Biddy Polichick squawking was drawing too much attention. Annoyed Wedgie looked up and clucked, Oh, just wait your turn, Miss Polichick. We, we will get to you as soon as we can. Wait my turn, squawked Biddy Polichick. What do you mean, wait my turn? Now you'll see here. As Biddy continued to complain, Wedgie stopped what she was doing and just glared at her. Chick tried to scrunch down a bit more and hope that Wedgie wouldn't come over. Just as Wedgie started to do that, Fudgy leaned over and said, I got this. Wedgie glared at her sister for a second, then shrugged and went back to her station. Chick wanted to bolt for the door, but being in the middle of a peeping mob and the doorway being blocked with a line of hens, their chicks, and roosters, not to mention the two mid-hens checking everyone at the door, and the one who may or may not have teeth, Chick was almost relieved it was Fudgy coming over and not Wedgie. Good morning, Miss Polichick. How are you and all these little Polichicks this morning? Fudgy, knowing there was no reasoning with Biddy Polichick, was hoping to soothe her ruffled feathers with diplomacy. When better? clucked Biddy Polichick brusquely. After that ruckus we had last night, I hardly got any sleep. Chick thought from the sound of her snoring that Biddy Polichick had gotten plenty of sleep. Biddy continued to complain. I had the devil of a time trying to get the children back to sleep, and now it's morning I need to get them the breakfast, but I can't because of this. She irritatedly waved her wing at the line of chickens wanting to get out. Oh, I understand, Miss Polichick, said Fudgy. We're really sorry for the inconvenience, but that ruckus you heard last night was caused by an intruder. An intruder? 
balked Betty Polichick. In the barn? Was it a predator? My word, we could have been killed, or worse, eaten. I thought you mid hens are supposed to keep intruders out of the barn. Isn't that what they give you corn for? Now, now, Miss Polichick, said Fudgy reassuringly. There's nothing to worry about. It was just a young cockerel. We suspect he snuck in here to woo one of the pullets. Ooh, said Biddy Polichick, very curious. Must have been a Galio Org. Those privileged types have no regard for others, walking around like they own the place. Well, we suspect it wasn't a Galio Org, not after that last incident, said Fudgy. Auntie Asidia promised that that wouldn't happen again. <laughs> then who? Lucked Biddy Polichick. We're not exactly sure, said Fudgy. Wedgie chimed in. A coop chick. We knew it was a coop chick. A coop chick? Yeah? Balked Biddy Polichick incredulously. Chick groaned to himself. They obviously knew who he was. Sapphira Oddwaddle had recognized him and must have told him. Chick knew he was doomed. Even if he got out of the barn in one piece, the mid-hens would come to the coop and get him, or worse, he would have to face June and explain why he was out after dark and in the barn. I suppose I shouldn't be entirely surprised, clucked Biddy Polichick. It's disgraceful the way the coop hens let their chicks have the run around the entire homestead. Their mothers should teach them better. Do you know whose coop chick it was? Well, we're not sure, said Fudgy. We've uh, been given conflicting names and descriptions. But we'll know for sure when we find him. Chick saw a glimmer of hope. Could it be in spite of being seen by Peck's mom, they weren't sure who he was? Chick wondered if perhaps Pick and Quinny did something to confuse her. Whatever it was, Chick knew that if he could get past this checkpoint, he'd be home free. You see that you do, said Biddy Polichick as she angrily fluffed out her feathers. And when you do, make sure you punish him to the fullest extent of the rules of the homestead. Yes, ma'am, said Fudgy. We think he might still be in here, which is why we set up this checkpoint. We've been given orders by our commander, the barn darm, to make sure... Whoever goes in and out actually belongs here. If that little bugger is still in here, we'll find him. <laughs> this is unacceptable, clucked Biddy Polichick pompously. Why should my children and I be made to suffer because you mid-hens let a rogue cockerel in the barn? My children are hungry, and I need to take them out now. Fudgy knew there was no point in arguing with Biddy Polichick. She was one of those hens who excelled at arguing. No one ever won an argument with Biddy Polichick, even if they were right. As far as Biddy was concerned, they could, they were the diggity diggity. No one ever won an argument with Biddy Polichick, even if they were right. Because, as far as Biddy Polichick was concerned, she was always right. Fudgy stood there thoughtfully rubbing her beak with the tip of her wing as she considered how to placate this fussy hen. In the meantime, the Polichick chicks were getting restless and began mealing about, pecking at each other and other chickens that were in the line with them. Finally, Fudgy said, Tell you what, Miss Polichick, why don't I just go ahead and process you and your chicks myself? That way we can go on ahead and get you outside. Well, I suppose that would work, said Biddy Polichick, being a bit disappointed she was really looking forward 
to complaining about the injustice that was being done to her and her chicks. Nonetheless, still determined to complain, Biddy Polichick grumbled, It's a bloody inconvenience, making a poor old hen like me wait like this with so many hungry mouths to feed. Which is all the more reason to get you outside, said Fudgy congenially. Now, if you'll just follow me. The mid-hen ushered Biddy Polichick and her chick brood to the front of the line. No one complained about their preferential treatment, because when it came to Biddy Polichick and her chicks, it was just a lot simpler just to get out of the way. Fudgy was exceptionally gifted and patient when it came to handling large groups of rowdy chicks. Now, now, she said, if we could get everyone to line up so I can verify that these are indeed your chicks. Well, who else would they be? squawked Biddy Polichick. You never know, said Fudgy obligingly, as she tried to get the chicks to form a line. Why, that little bugger could have slipped into your clutch unnoticed. Absolutely not, squawked Biddy Polichick indignantly. I'm a diligent and observant mother, and I most certainly would have noticed if there were any chicks in my clutch that weren't mine. Fudgy did not respond. She just nodded at her as an indication that at least outwardly she agreed with the irate hen. She had gotten the chicks to more or less form their own line at the door, which for a very, very brief moment was single file, but that soon deteriorated. It collapsed into chick rows of two, threes, fours, and so on. Fudgy stood there and looked out at the undulating and multitude rows of chicks. This is as good as it's going to get, she muttered to herself. Then standing just inside the doorway, Fudgy began letting the chicks out gradually in groups of three, four, five, six, sevens, or whatever. The Paula Chick chicks were in and of themselves a force of nature to be reckoned with. Biddy Polichick, standing near the back of the chick line, complained, I am telling you this is an absolute waste of time. I can tell by one glance that every one of these chicks are mine. Fudgy did not respond. She just stood there moving the chicks along. Are you listening to me? balked Biddy Polichick. These are my chicks, so you just as well let them go out Right now! Then Fud then suddenly Fudgy held up her wing and said, Hold it! She did so with such authority that not only did the line of Paula Chick Chick stop moving, the Paula Chick Chick standing just outside the door stopped their squabbling and stood there staring. Even Wedgie and the chickens in her line stopped moving. And what do we have here? clucked Fudgy. From where she was standing, no one else in either line could see who she had found. Did you find our intruder? asked Wedgie hopefully. Biddy Polichick didn't say a word. She just stood there getting red round the beak. Not quite, said Fudgy, as she lifted the chick up in her wings. Everyone saw it was Peck Oddwaddle. Wedgie snidely remarked, Well, Miss Polichick, so much for all the chicks in your brood belonging to you. Undeterred, Biddy Polichick clucked, Well, if you're going to be literal about it, then no. The Polichicks and the Odd Waddles are somewhat related. Oh, really? said Wedgie doubtfully. Yes, replied Biddy Polichick firmly. That Safari is my fifth cousin by marriage on my mother's side, making Peck my sixth cousin technically one of mine. Biddy Polichick then added in a very icy tone, 
And before you add another snide comment, Wedgie, I did indeed know he was here. He is, after all, family, technically added Fudgy, helpfully. Beatty Polichick responded coolly. Yes, technically. I saw no need to mention it. That's a bit of a stretch, don't you think? Asked Wedgie. Mother's whatever, umpteenth cousin. Huh, sixth cousin, Beatty Polichick corrected her. Fifth, sixth, seventh, whatever, said Wedgie dismissively. If you go back that far, you can say that all the chickens in the homestead are related. Be that as it may, said Biddy Polichick. My chicks are no strangers to the odd waddle nest, the barrel they live in, which is quite quaint. My chicks go over there often to visit the cousins, so while our bud lines may be distant, we are indeed close in other ways, like family. Therefore, once again, I reiterate, Peck is one of mine. Feeling she had made her case, Biddy Polichick crossed her wings and curtly nodded. Wedgie rolled her eyes and clucked, something under her breath as she went back to processing her line of chickens. Meanwhile, the chicks and chickens in both lines and the ones outside stood watching and waiting to see what would happen next. When Fudgy sat Peck down, she placed her wings on her hips and asked in a no-nonsense tone, Peck, would you please care to tell me what in the blazes are you doing trying to sneak out with Biddy Polichick's chick brood? It is my understanding that your mother has uh, grounded you to the nest for misbehavior. Peck stammered, I will... Uh, I, I was. I, I am. I mean, Mom uh, was taking Quinny and me out for breakfast when I got separated from her. I'm allowed to be out for breakfast in a dust bath. Oh, indeed you are, said Fudgy good-naturedly. But I don't see your mom anywhere. No, oh, that's because she's already outside, replied Peck. When Fudgy gave Peck a doubting look, the little chick hung his head and muttered, Well... At least I think she is. Ah, so you think so, said Fudgy. She turned to her bigger sister and asked, Wedgie, do you happen to recall if Sapphira Oddwaddle has already been through the line? Well, not that I've seen, said Wedgie, as she ushered another chicken out the door. Peck anxiously peeped. She is. I know she is. Fudgy looked sternly at the young chick and asked, Are you sure, Peck? Peck withered under Fudgy's gaze and looking downcast mumbled, Well, maybe she is. I, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. Then suddenly Fudgy said, oh, Maybe she is. Peck cautiously raised his gaze and in a quiet, hopeful voice said, Ah, I'm pretty sure she is. She may be, said Fudgy. Since we're not sure, why don't you wait for her just outside the door? Then either way, you won't miss her. The relief Peck felt shone brightly in his eyes as he replied, Earnestly, yes, ma'am, I will. And as Peck scampered out the door, Fudgy turned her attention back to the line of Polichick chicks, who surprisingly enough had not moved. There was something about Fudgy's strict demeanor with a, just a hint of good humor that was confusing to all the Polichick chicks. Fudgy clucked officiously, okay, okay. Let's get the rest of you outside. Come along, come along. Peck stood just outside the door and watching the parade of Paula chicks, and he heard something. Psst, psst, psst. It sounded like a bug hissing. Peck looked around but saw nothing. After a few minutes, he heard it again. Psst, psst. 
When he didn't turn around, he felt something bounce off the back of his head. Peck looked around, but all he saw were Paula chicks and a few other chickens and their own chicks who were trying to stay out of the way of the Paula chick horde. Then he heard, Psst! Peck! Psst! Peck! It wasn't a bug hissing. It sounded like someone was calling his name in a loud whisper. When Peck turned around, a pebble bounced off his forehead. Ow! He said... Peck rubbed his head as he looked into the direction where he thought the pebble had been thrown. There he saw, peeking around the corner of the barn, was a scruffy reddish-brown head. It was Chick. Chick motioned with his wing for Peck to come over. Peck surreptitiously glanced up at Fudgy and saw she was far too busy moving the rest of the Paula Chick chicks through to notice, also standing next to her being a very too annoyed to even notice anything else was Biddy Polichick complaining and explaining why she and her chicks should not be made to wait in line. Peck made a mad dash around the corner of the barn and then he and Chick both ran down the path that led through the thorny thicket to the back of the barn. When they got to the end of the path, they looked back to see if anyone had followed them. Seeing that no one did, they plopped down on the ground. Oh, I'm glad I found you, wheezed Peck. Chick panted, me too. That bitty poly chick sure got a lot of kids. That was something you and me sneaking out of the same chick brood. (laughs) Oh, I know, said Peck. But I thought I was done for when Fudgy caught me. Oh, me too, said Chick. Peck looked at Chick amazed and said, Fudgy saw you, he asked. Then why didn't she pull you out of line? I'm not sure, said Chick, but it sure looked like as if she did see me. I was nearly to the door when I was scrunched down as low as I could go, praying that no one would notice me. Then I saw you, and when I turned back, Wedgie was looking right at me. Um, maybe she didn't see you, said Peck. I didn't. Yeah, but you're short and in the crowd, said Chick. Fudgy is taller and had a much better view. She looked right at me and I thought she did. No way, said Peck. If she saw you, she would have taken you out of the line like she did me. You were the whole reason that we had that checkpoint set up in the first place. I suppose, said Chick, but when... She saw, I mean, thought she saw me. I could have sworn she winked. Then she shooed me outside with the other chicks. Maybe she just let you go because she thinks you're Quinty's boyfriend, said Peck. The chick thought if that was true, then he was in more danger than he thought. Being friends with Quinty was somewhat risky, but being her boyfriend was downright dangerous because if he did anything to upset her, then he'd have to contend with Fudgy. Then, speaking up trouble, up popped Quinny, showing up like a bad colonel. She hopped out of her hiding place and peeped, Hello, boys! Startled, Peck and Chick both practically jumped out of their feathers. Holy corn! gasped Peck. You nearly gave me a heart attack. Oh, you poor little egg, said Quinny, teasingly. Oh, yeah, I was, said Quinny, but when she finally noticed that you gave her the slip, she got pretty mad and went back to look for you. Meanwhile, I just went right to the front door and Wedgie let me out straight away. I didn't even have to stand in line. I guess being a brat has its privileges, said Peck. Watch it, bud, said Quinny, as she gave Peck a little shove. When Mom finds out, she's going to scramble your eggs. You'll be grounded to the barrel until you're an old gray rooster. So chirped Peck. As long as she doesn't find me until I'm done helping Chick, I couldn't care less. There are some things more important than being grounded. Chick was impressed for such a scrawny Chick. Peck was showing a lot of courage. 
sneaking out was riskier for Peck than it was for him, or even Quinny for that matter. Having a mom like Sapphira Oddwaddle was tough. Not that his own mom was a pushover. She hard on Chick when she needed to be, but the biggest difference between Sapphira Oddwaddle and June Pinfeather was that June did what she did to try to keep Chick out of trouble. Sapphira did what she did because she was embarrassed by Peck and wanted to change him. June was never ashamed of Chick. Annoyed, yes, but never ashamed. Chick had never had anyone except his own parents be willing to put themselves at risk to help him. Peck was a true friend. So what are we going to do, asked Quinny. We? asked Chick. Yes, we, chirped Quinny. I'm in this too. In fact, she added quite smugly, I have a plan. Chick replied skeptically, Oh, you do, do you? I do, replied Quinny. And if you're going to be all smarty feathers about it, I just may not tell you. She then stuck her beak in the air in an expression of severe indignation. We should probably hear her out, said Peck, and besides, what could it hurt? Annoyed Chick reluctantly agreed. All right, Quinny, tell us your wonderful plan. Quinny crossed her wings and snidely replied, No, not unless you ask me nicely. Oh, for corn's sake, peep Chick. Fine. Quinny, would you please tell us your most excellent, wonderful plan? Say it like you mean it, said Quinny. Oh, I don't have time for this, said Chick. Come on, Peck, let's go. As Chick started to leave, Quinny cried out, All right, all right, I'll tell you. Geez, I was just having a little fun. Chick stopped and looked at Quinny with his wings crossed. All right, here it is, said Quinny. To beat Aunt Isidia at her own game, we need to find someone to speak to the Council of Antes on your mom's behalf. Someone who understands the rules better than Aunt Isidia. That's your plan, peeped Chick. That's my plan, which I might add that I told you already, and besides, I don't need to find somebody. I already got somebody. Peck. He's too young, said Quinny. The Council of Aunties doesn't allow Chicks to speak for anybody. What difference does that make, asked Chick. He's smart. I bet he's smarter than Auntie Asidia and knows the rules better than she does. Chick then turned to Peck for support. Right? Am I right? Tell her I'm right. Peck shook his head and said, No, Chick, Quinny is right. I appreciate your confidence, I really do. But Quinny is right. The Council of Aunties would never let me speak for your mom. Besides, I'm no match for Aunt Asidia. Chick started to protest, but Peck cut him off. Aunt Asidia didn't get to where she is now by not knowing the rules. What we need is someone who not only knows all the rules, including the ones that go all the way back to the great Gallian liberation. The great what? asked Chick. You never heard of the great Gallian liberation? chirped Quinny. It's one of the first things they teach you in Chick etiquette class. That's how everyone learns what their place in the homestead is. How are you going to know what to do when you grow up if you don't go to chick etiquette class? Yeah, I don't need a class to tell me what to do or what I'm going to be when I grow up, said Chick. But everyone has to go, repeated Quinny. It's a rule. One of many rules that are selectively enforced, said Peck. There are some coupons that don't send their chicks to chick etiquette class. No one bothers with them because of their low status. Uh, lucky coopies, said Quinny. Wish I didn't have to go. Good for you, Quinny, said Peck enthusiastically. Chick etiquette class is a tool of 
or oppressive homestead culture that reinforces a caste system designed to keep the lower class chicken subjugated by the chicken elite, all of which is determined by something as arbitrary as where you were hatched. Peck then placed a wing on Quinny's shoulder and added, Quinny, you are to be commended for not wanting to participate in such an archaic, repressive, educational process. Uh, and it's boring, said Quinny. I don't want to go to chick etiquette class because it's boring. I suppose that's that, said Peck. As I was saying, we need to find someone who understands and knows all the rules, even the ones going back to the great Gallian liberation and the founding of the homestead, which would not only be all the rules of the homestead, but their exceptions as well. What are exceptions, asked Chick? Peck explained. Exceptions are a list of reasons why it would be okay not to enforce a certain rule. There are exceptions to every rule. Exceptions asked, Chick. Oh, I'm almost afraid to ask, but are there a lot of rules? Hundreds, said Peck, if not more. More, peeped Chick, and every rule has an exception. At least, said Peck, and most have more than one. For example, the rule about illegally harvesting corn states, the punishment is exile from the homestead, but the exceptions state a chicken who's trying to keep himself or someone in his brood or even another chicken that is not part of his brood from starving. And that's just three exceptions to that one rule. Most of the other rules have more than that, and don't even get me started on the exceptions to the exceptions. That usually happens when an exception becomes enforced so often it becomes a rule by default, and then there are exceptions to that. Why, I know of one exception that has, Stop! yeeped Chick, cutting Peck off. All this information is making my head hurt. Everything is so complicated. How can anyone keep track of it all? Don't you see, said Quinny? That's something in your favor. No one can know all the rules. That's true, said Peck. I suspect that Auntie a City would be knowledgeable about the more modern rules, but she can't know all the old rules, especially the really old ones going back to the Gallian liberation, those rules are ancient and seldom enforced, but they are still rules, and even Auntia Sidia has to keep the rules. You think that Auntia Sidia is breaking rules, asked Chick? Peck replied, not as such, but it has occurred to me there are a lot of those really old rules that aren't being enforced. Quinny peeped up. Like the one that says chicks should go to chick etiquette class? That's not a rule specifically for chicks, said Peck. However, it does state that all underage cockerels and pullets are required to attend chick etiquette class. The exception to the rule is if he or she is unable to do so because of a family hardship, handicap, illness, or disability. As far as I know, none of those rules would necessarily apply to Chick. Not unless you count as being a lame brain as a disability, chirped Quinny jokingly. Then both of you could be excused, and you too, peeped Chick. Peck continued, It stand to reason with so many rules having been made along with all the exceptions that there is no way anyone can keep up with all of them. It is quite possible that somewhere there is a rule that can help your dad. We just have to find it. What we need is a rule fair, said Quinny. A 
A roo what? Rule fair, said Quinny. What's a rule fair? Peck explained. A rule fair is someone who has spent years and years studying and learning all the rules, including the really old ones. Rule fairs are supposed to know every rule, their exceptions, even the ones going all the way back to the founding of the homestead. They are so knowledgeable, in fact, they have been known to come before the Council of Aunties to prove a chicken's innocence. Well, that's good, right? Asked Chick. They have also been known to prove a chicken's guilt, said Peck. Oh, said Chick. Uh, that's not so good. But if we find a rule fair and get her to agree to help us, then we'd be okay, right? It's not as simple as that, said Peck. Once we find a rule fair and tell her what the situation is, she will examine all the rules and their exceptions. As she finds that you are innocent, then she is bound by the rules to speak to the Council of Aunties on your behalf. So, said Chick, like I said, that's good, right? It is, said Peck, unless she determines that you are indeed guilty. Then she is also required by those same rules to speak to the Council of Antis against you. So you see, asking a rule fair for help is not always a good thing. Feeling frustrated and angry, Chick declared, Stupid rules, stupid rule fair, stupid Council of Antis, I hate this. Rules and rule fairs, it's just a load of chicken berries. We should be able to do what we want without a bunch of old crotchety old aunties sticking their beaks in where they don't belong. Why shouldn't my dad be able to give a little corn to help a friend? And what difference does it make if he's not a chicken? It's just stupid. I agree, said Peck. In the old days, things were a lot simpler. There were fewer chickens back then, and we all lived together in one flock. Quinny peeped up. What? You mean Galioarchs and Galatarians and Coopies all living together? In those days, said Peck, there were no Galioarchs or Galatarians or Coopies. We were all one brood. Yeah, but as the population grew, things got complicated and it was harder for chickens to get along. In order to keep everyone under control, a group of chickens got together and started coming up with the rules. Kind of like that was how they started the first council of aunties, asked Chick. It's exactly what it was, said Peck. At first it wasn't so bad. The rules were fairly straightforward, like no chicken could, should steal from another chicken, no chicken should harm another chicken, and things like that. It was to ensure that everyone got along. Well, that doesn't sound so bad, said Quinny. It wasn't, said Peck, but it wasn't long before chickens on the council were passing rules to keep other chickens under control. They enjoyed the power and the prestige that came from being in charge, and they wanted to keep it. It was the birth of the ruling elite. Where do you get all this stuff, asked Quinny. Peck kind of got red around the beak and said, well, uh, uh, I pay attention, and Chick etiquette class. I ain't peck suspiciously. Quinny said, I pay attention in chick etiquette class too. And I never heard any of this. Chick kind of laughed. Quinny turned and yeeped angrily at him. You think I don't pay attention in chick etiquette class? No offense, Quinny said Chick, but I think the only thing you really pay attention to is yourself. Now it was Quinny's turn to get red right around the beat. Just because I'm beautiful doesn't mean I don't listen. Oh, please, said Chick. You said it yourself. Chick etiquette class bores you. Quinny stood there looking like a kernel of corn getting ready to pop. Remembering how loudly she could yell, Chick took a step back. Don't get me wrong, Quinny, said Chick carefully. I agree with you. Chick etiquette class sounds boring. Chick cast an anxious look at Peck, 
who had also taken a cautionary step backwards. Simmering with anger, Quinny peeped. I'll have you two goofnuts know that just because I'm bored and just because I'm beautiful don't mean I, that I don't learn stuff. After all, it was my idea to find a rule fair. Peck rolled his eyes and clicked his beak. Quinny exploded. Don't roll your eyes and click your beak at me. Startled Chick and Peck both scooted backwards until they could feel the points of the thorns poking them in the tail feathers. Calming down a bit, Quinny peeped crossly. I may not get every word in class, but I hear enough to know when someone is making stuff up. Peck peeped defensively. I, I'm not making stuff up. My suppositions concerning the evolution of the ruling elite in the homestead are valid conclusions based on my own research. Aha! chirped Quinny triumphantly. That's brainy talk for making things up. Peck peeped. It's not made up. Quinny poked Peck in the chest and said, Oh yeah? If it's not made up, then where did you learn it? Intimidated, Peck weakly peeped. I, I have my sources. Quinny pressing the point. What sources? I, I talked to other chickens, said Peck. Older chickens. Quinny sarcastically replied, They must be some really old chickens if they're from the olden days. Um, they may not be that old, but the elder chickens of every brood have a rich oral history that has been passed down from generation to generation. Some of these accounts don't always agree with the official record that has been preserved by the Council of Antes. I've been trying to collect these stories, especially from the elders of the smaller brood. We have no one to pass them down to, because when they die, that part of history dies with them. Who cares, said Quinny. All that just means is that'd be just less stuff we have to learn. It's hard enough to learn the stuff they want us to without adding any more. Besides, how is all this going to help Chick? It's about finding the truth, said Peck, and... The truth is not just going to help Chick, it's going to help all of us. As much as he hated to admit it, Chick agreed with Quinny. He wasn't sure how what Peck was talking about was going to help his dad. All the stories in the world won't be as useful as one rule fair, said Quinny. Chick had his doubts about that as well. From what he understood, a, a rule fair could just as easily hurt his dad's case as help it. Peck asked Quinny, Do you know where we can find a rule fair? With an embarrassing realization, Quinny realized she had reached the limits of her chick etiquette education. She stammered, Well, I, uh, well... Then she quickly turned it back to Peck and peeped accusingly. Hey, you should know where to find a rule fair because after all, you're supposed to be the brains of this outfit. I'm more of the poulet fatale, a what? A bratty chick who gets her way by trying to be cute, said Peck. Quinny primly stuck her beak in the air and said, No. It means a cute chick that people want to do things for. You're just jealous because you're not as adorable as me. Peck rolled his eyes again and Quinny shot him a look. Fearing another outburst, Peck lifted his wings and quickly said, Sorry, sorry. Instead of yelling, Quinny got in his face. I bet you don't even know where to find a rule fair, do you? No, I don't, said Peck. Being a rule fair is a highly demanding job. There aren't a lot of chickens who can stand up to the strain. Not to mention the fact that they have fallen out of favor with the Council of Antes. Is that more of your research, said Quinny? As a matter of fact, it is, said Peck. The Antes used to call upon a rule fair to help them make a case against a chicken. 
But all too often than not, the rule fair found the chicken compliant with the rules because of an exception that the aunties overlooked. Oh, I bet they didn't like that, said Chick. No, they didn't, said Peck, and the rule fairs didn't allow themselves to be manipulated. The council vanties had become a bunch of bickering old biddies who each was trying to push their own political agenda. A rule fair's only concern is truth in maintaining the integrity of the rules. They care nothing for political infighting of a bunch of disgruntled aunties. The chick's discussion was interrupted by Fudgy, who was coming down the path. Chick would have run for it, but there was nowhere to go. Once again, Fudgy's immense girth blocked the path, and it was too late for him to try to hide in the thorny brush. Oh, there you are, Miss Quinny, said Fudgy, totally ignoring Chick. I've been looking for you. Your mother has sent me to fetch you for your play date with young Bernie Malcolm. A play date with Bernie, quipped Chick. Quinny looked at Chick and angrily peeped. Not a word. Then, quickly composing herself and turning to Fudgy, she coyly replied, Of course, Fudgy, I'm coming, but could you just give me a moment, please? Oh, yes, miss, replied the mid hen ditifully. She walked back up the path a discreet distance and waited. Quinny turned to Chick, and with a prissy flick of her wings, Quinny replied, But there's no need to be jealous. I can use my charm to get information. How else do you think I got the information about your dad? It was from Bernie, and he was also the one that told me about the rule fair. Ha! <laughs> chirped Peck. I knew you didn't learn about rule fairs from Chick Etiquette. Actually, Bernie told me about it after class, said Prinny, so it was close enough. I just happened to casually mention that I was in awe of his mother because she was so powerful and smart and probably the greatest legal mind of the homestead. As Quinny was talking, Peck nudged Chick and put his wing up to his beak and made a gagging motion. Quinny saw him and snidely chirped, You're so crude. Anyway, I asked Bernie if there was anyone who knew the rules better than his mother, and Bernie told me that only a rule fair knew the rules better than his mom. Well, that's a heck of a sacrifice, Quinny, said Chick. But I wouldn't wish Bernie's company on anybody, not even you. How sweet of you to be concerned, replied Quinny. But don't worry, I'm a big chick and I can take care of myself. Who knows, maybe I'll find us a rule fair. At that moment, Fudgy came back down the path and said, Oh, that's no dawdling, Miss Quinny. Your mother is waiting to take you to the Malcolms. Quinny batted her eyes and sweetly replied, Yes, Fudgy, we mustn't keep Mother waiting. She then turned to Chick and Peck and said, See you later, boys. She then stuck out her tongue at them and pertly skipped up the path. As she left, Fudgy leaned down to Peck. Oh, and you best get going as well, Mr. Peck, she cautioned. Your mother's in a right state, so you best get to where you... You're supposed to be before she finds that you aren't there, if you take my meaning. Yes, Fudgy, said Peck, thank you. He then scurried back up the path and slipped into the barn. That left Chick alone with Fudgy. Not sure what to do, Chick just stood there. And you, young Chick, said Fudgy. We had us a right big ruckus in the barn last night which I'm sure you know nothing about. Hmm, can't say that I do, replied Chick coolly. No, I suppose you don't, said Fudgy, and she gave him a wink. Now you best be hightailing it back to the coop. We wouldn't want you to get blamed for anything else now, would we? Doing his best to maintain his coolness, Chick replied, I, I believe I will. Thanks, Fudgy. Chick couldn't figure out if Fudgy was being lenient or maybe she really didn't know it was him. 
who was in the barn last night. He decided not to look gift corn in the cob and scampered back up the path. Fudgy watched him go, and when Chick had scooted out of sight, she sighed and shook her head. She then walked back up the path to resume her mid-hen duties, totally unaware of the pair of large dark eyes that were watching her, Chick, and his friends from deep in the thorny brush.